why we think it's valid. Oh. Uh, Chad, I, I do have a question on this. Are you able to hear me? My audible? Sorry, I'm sorry, I could not hear that. Am I audible now? Can you hear it? No. You have, you have to come up here. This, oh, this, the, the microphone is here. <laughs> Is this any better? That's a PC app. It's a PC mic. Are you able to hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you. Okay, perfect. If you don't mind, uh, can you go back to the questionnaire, the very first question that you had for the generic website? Yes, I'll have to pull that from the other monitor. So hang on for one sec. Sure. And I'm going to give you an opportunity to try actually try this out if the tech gods are good to us. So yeah. here's that first yeah. question. Yeah, so if you, if you just stay there, right? Um, so typically what I've learned is uh, that when, uh, when you're asking the question, especially in a survey, um, you know, you want to try and stay away from ands and ors. So in this case, right, the question says, the website has it has all the information and capabilities, like information capabilities are two different things in my mind. What are your thoughts on that? Right? Should, is that the right way to do it and then get that distinguishing factor in the second question, which talks about the missing or the or can be improved? Or would you what 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 are your thoughts? You know, should that be kept separate by asking two different questions about information versus the capability? Yeah. Well, look, I think, uh, first of all, you can tweak the question any way you want. And you don't need to do that. Uh, you don't need to use an and. But it's in, the way this thing works is it's not a precise kind of thing. Um, the questions are not mathematically orthogonal. Uh, some things may appear in different, Different users might put the same kind of comment in different questions. That's really not going to make any difference because what you really want out of this is their comments and you want to give them a general feel for what we're talking about. Let me go through a little bit of the, um, the logic that has come to these questions and then maybe we can come back to that. Carly, I had a question. While you have that screen there. Yeah. Would it be possible to see? I was curious because on the last question you had ten yes uh, categories, and I was curious for the inside Princeton uh, response. If is it possible to show us the bar the bar graph for the ten ten um, ten yeah. for the last question? Sure. I was curious how the ten worked out. People are very comfortable with rating things on a scale of one to ten. And it's very deliberately put on at the bottom after they've gone through the other five questions. Is this it? No, this is not it. I'm sorry. Um, here we go. Yeah. So the reason and I'm, I'm just feeling a lot of time pressure here, uh, so I'm not sure I can give you as good an answer as I'd like to. Here, here are the bar, here's the bar graph for the one to 10. And the reason that it's at the bottom is that hopefully by going through these questions in a very specific order, they've been very carefully ordered, this has gotten them to sort of think about this as a whole. The way we actually used this was we built our first version of this. We gave it to, I believe, 20 or 30 people to work work on for two weeks as a beta. And uh, then after that, we assembled them in a focus group. And the first thing I had them do in the focus group was to fill this out. And that caused them to have to think through their comments. And then... Within the focus group, we then said, okay, now let's sit down and talk about each one of these and what you really want. And we got an amazing amount of information out of it. And what you'll find is that very often uh, people use what's called the um, 
these scales of one to 10, the net uh, NPR is the net uh, performance indicator, NPI, or um, which you see all the time, which is usually how likely are you to recommend this to a colleague? And that gets rather complex because it's not actually scored on a basis of one to 10. But I did a quick study on this with some vendor software where we had a very complex uh, rubric that took people an hour to fit out, fill out. And then I ran them through this. And what I did was I correlated the one to 10 against all of the um, the large complex rubrics that they gave. And it was almost a perfect correlation. One question that they could fill out in a couple of seconds gave us as much information as having 60 people sit down and give us detailed information, which is not to say there wasn't value in the detailed information. And so sometimes what we even do is we just give them the one to 10 and we alternate it. Let's say um, where we'll ask if we have a large audience, we'll we'll uh, have the software set up to give three or four one to tens. And then we give them the, we give the, the fourth or fifth person, the full um, 5d assessment. Does that kind of get to your, uh, your, your answer? Yes. Thank you. I was curious how you, you know, after you had uh, gotten those results, were you able to bring the 30% that had voted uh, number seven, were you able to bring some fraction of them up to vote for number nine? Hugely. Oh, you were. Uh, okay, thank you. What, what actually happened was that go, through the process of doing it, we discovered that we, the designers, had made a wrong assumption about what people wanted. And uh, it doesn't matter on the details. I don't think we have time to really go into it. I assume we have to stop at 220 exactly. So. Um, but essentially, we we had put made some design decisions about separating business things from uh, other other um, other websites that they might be interested in. Um, they didn't get it, and they didn't want it. And we went back and we redesigned it. And when we redesigned it, we went from you know like those that thirty percent way up to almost all fives. Uh, thank you. So that was one of the things that convinced me how powerful uh, this was. So basically, and I don't know that given the time we have, I'll be able to get through all of this, but I will try to speak as quickly as I can. Uh, I want to talk to you about the problem I'm trying to solve and talk about what I mean by operational definitions of UX and show you the 5D rubric, rubrics in general, the 5D rubric and then to the 5D assessment, and then give you an opportunity to try it out on the website that I'm putting together called 5drubric.org. Um, so let's talk about the problem, which is that, you know, after 60 years of doing this, there is so much bad UX going out there that it's just staggering. And the question is, why is there so much bad UX? And I'm going to suggest that there are four reasons for it. So, because we who are UX designers, I think we've got it down. We know how to do UX. We've got really good user-centered design techniques. We've got per personas and user journeys and usability testing and all sorts of great techniques. And we are capable of producing great stuff. But when it goes through the process of implementation within organizations, it gets destroyed. And what comes out are some serious problems. And why is that? Well, one reason um, is what I would call a lack of maturity within UX maturity within organizations. I can say that's true of Princeton. So, you know, people on some level think UX is, is sort of important but it's not part of their DNA. They don't really understand it the way they understand things like security and privacy. They think it's an action, something you do. And believe it or not, after eight years there that I've been educating people in UX, 
some people still can't tell the difference between mm -hmm. quality assurance and a usability test. A second thing which is true of many organizations, and I would say not Princeton, but uh, certainly I've seen in years of consulting with commercial organizations, is they don't care a whole lot about their customers. Uh, I remember working with a bunch of executives at a very large retail firm. Um, and I asked them, you know, what is really important? And they said, shareholder value. That is our primary job. Whereas a UX person, I would say your primary job is to make your customers happy. And I think that we see this over and over again, that organizations are focused on bottom line stuff and not on customer satisfaction. It's almost impossible to get to a customer service uh, link these days on sites. For example, try to get the customer service on Amazon. It's almost impossible. Uh, in fact, it's so difficult that I keep it in my bookmarks because I usually can't find it. Third reason is that UX design is a craft. And much like programming is a craft, architecture is a craft, movie making is a craft, but business processes are not crafts. They're operational things, and we don't have a good way of integrating in. And people don't understand, people outside UX, don't understand how to integrate UX activities into their projects. One manager said to me, what you do isn't really important. What's important is that I deliver this stuff on time and on budget. And if we can get some good UX, well, that's a, that's a great secondary kind of thing, but it certainly isn't primary. So these are, I think, problems that we have to solve. And the way that I think we will solve that and what I've been working on for the past several years is operationalizing UX, which is to say, taking the things we do in user experience and fitting them into the larger system development life cycles and integrating it into business processes. And I started doing that and discovered that that was too much for people to swallow. It, it was just too overwhelming. Uh, and one of the things that I've learned in business and I've been very bad at is you've got to feed them in very small pieces and sort of let this work over a period of time. So it seemed to me the first place that we should start is we need an agreed upon definition of user experience. I spoke to lots and lots of people. I ran uh, some online questionnaires and I said, give me your best definition of user experience. And I got back all sorts of interesting stuff, but it wasn't consistent from person to person. Everybody has a slightly different idea of what UX is. And unless we can make it concrete and replicable and measurable, you're not really going to be able to integrate the various functions within an organization. This is a problem that I'm a psychologist by training, and this happens all the time in psychology. And there we, you know, we study things like, say, happiness. And what does happiness mean? Um, there is no easy definition of a complicated construct like happiness. You've got to give it a... Um, You've got to find a way to operationalize it. So we create these operational definitions and say, well, it means that on a scale administered every day, you know, for a month, people will have a value, you know, will say they are at least 80% happy. Or when we're having conversations with them, they will smile 70% of the time, whatever, I'm making these things up. Um, UX is rich. It's very multidimensional. And, the and what we come up with as an operational definition has to work for UX professionals because that's the people who get really into the details, but it's got to be straightforward enough 
so that people outside the field can say, yeah, that makes sense to me. And it has to provide enough um, of a framework to guide decisions. One of my colleagues talks about being nibbled to death by ducks. Every decision, if you don't think about the UX consequences, it just takes a little bit away, a little bit away. And over the course of a project, you end up with a B minus or a C or a C minus or even a D in terms of the user experience. And it's got to be replicable and it's got to be actionable and it's got to be measurable because that's the only thing that people outside UX will accept as reasonable. So that brings us to the notion of operational definitions and the 5D rubric is an operational definition of user experience. And it comes from, I've had three major inspirations in building this. One was the work of Whitney Quisenberry who developed something called the five E's. Uh, one was Peter Morville, who you may uh, built a hexagon, which tried to show different facets of UX. And one was Jacob Nielsen, who developed 10 heuristics for a good UX. And all of these were very valuable co um, contributions, but to my mind did not cohere in being really accurate definitions of what I was trying to capture. So what you wanna do when you've got a multi-dimensional complex construct like um, usability or user experience is you can use a rubric to put that down. Here are some examples of, of things. Uh, we wanna give bonuses to our most effective managers. What's a most effective manager? How do you define that? You don't have a clear definition of that. Um, or um, I want to pick the right car for my family. Well, what does that mean? Does it mean that it's six, six seater, a four seater, a two seater, an SUV, electric, um, gas, hybrid, uh, expensive, inexpensive? I mean, there are so many dimensions. Um, the most common definition of this is we want students to write a good essay. I learned this from my kids because they would bring these rubrics home from school. And if you're younger than me, uh, you've probably encountered these in your own education, but they didn't use them when I was in school. Or um, we want to create a good user experience. And again, we need to find a way to define that. So let's just take a moment to look at what, um, the student essay. You start off when you want to create a rubric by figuring out what the dimensions are. So for example, and again, I've made these up, you might choose different ones as a teacher, but I'm interested in the problem that the student is going to address. I want to look at the quality of the argument that the student is making. I want to look at whether they're getting their information from good sources. And I want to I want their essay to be well written. So here are four dimensions of that rubric. And for each one of those, what I need is a definition. I need to say, what do I mean by the problem? Well, I want a clear um, definition of the problem statement. Or what do I mean by well-written? Well, perhaps that means great gra correct grammar and spelling or using the right words. Uh, or for sources, they're not reading it out of an encyclopedia, but they're actually going to primary source material. And then the third part of a rubric is typically some sort of criteria that you're going to use. So you tell the people, how you're going to decide how well they've achieved the goals that you've set out in the definitions. Does that all make sense so far? Yes. Great. So the nice thing about rubrics is that you can use them both for design and you can use them for 
um, rating and for evaluating an assessment. And you can use them iteratively. Uh, Sorry. I messed up with two slides that overlap. I see that. I don't know what to do about it, but skip the stuff on the top. We're only looking at the three things on the bottom. I haven't changed the top. Um, so in the beginning, you give the people the rubric and you say, this is what you work to. This is what you design to. And then what you, when you evaluate it, you say, now I'm going to evaluate it the way we decided we'd evaluate. And then you give it back to the person and you can say, here's what was strong and here's what was weak. And the person can go back to the rubric and they can redesign and fix. And this is, you can reevaluate and you can do this over and over again until you take an okay or a miserable essay and turn it into a great essay. And this is, of course, exactly analogous to the agile development process. This is what we do. We start out with an MVP and we go through it over and over and we iteratively refine, we measure and make better. So let me show you the rubric that I've developed for user experience. Um, it starts off with an assumption that every, uh, every interactive product or service is a tool. People use it, even if it's a game, you're going to it because you've got some kind of goal in mind. And either it's going to make it easy for you or it's going to make it hard for you. And that's a great thing because people know a lot about tools. We are tool-making animals. And so we know what a good tool is and what a bad tool is, and we know what we want in tools. And so by extending that to user experience, I went out to a whole bunch of UX people, and I said, what do you consider to be the dimensions of UX? And we came up with five of them, and then I tested that by going to more people and saying, is anything major missing? So what makes a great tool? Sorry, uh, Parker, can you back up to the previous I'm slide? I'm sorry. Can you back up to the previous slide for a second? I didn't understand one you Yeah. Uh, what's a Fumier? What's so, a? Tools are a Fumier. I think that he meant familiar. OK, thank you. Yeah, I warned you about the spelling problems. Uh, and I'm, not, I'm not judging. <laughs> I had some. I had a horrible experience this morning when I was trying to do a, a text message to a friend that's going into surgery, and they said it would be two hours instead of six hours, and I wrote back that two is better than sex. <laughs> this went out to all my friends. <laughs> so it is a frustration. Um, let's say the first thing for any tool is it's got to do what you need whether it's a simple tool like a hammer and what you want to do is pound in a nail or you want to go from one place to another and you want an airplane and it's a really complex tool. The question is, does it do basically what you need it to do? Or is there something you can't do that you need to do? So that becomes your first dimension and I call that empowering the yeah. User experience must be empowering. The second thing is efficiency. Something can be empowering, but not be efficient. An example of that is if you have to knock in two nails, um, that you can use the hammer. But if you're building a house and you have to make, knock in 5,000 nails, you're a lot better off with a nail gun because it's more efficient. Both do the same basic job but one of them is much more efficient than the other. And in software, there are lots and lots of examples I can point to where efficiency is very poor because, I mean, examples for me personally are things that pop up on the screen and they're timed and they disappear. Or on my Samsung phone, they pop things up and they don't disappear and they cover all the things I need to to get at, and I have to wait, you know, half a minute or 45 seconds for them to go away 
before I can take the next step. Or you have a form, and when you go back, everything is missing. You have to fill the same things in over and over and over again. Or getting through passwords when there's no way to show the password and all you get are dots, which for somebody like myself, it can take me 10 minutes to sign in in the morning before I get it right because I can't see where I made the mistake and correct it. The third dimension of this is that it's not to be intuitive. If, you, if, if it's not easy to use, if it doesn't work the way you expect it to work, you're going to have to go through training. You're going to have to read things. You're going to have to stop. You're going to have to figure things out. And that just makes it much harder, more expensive, and it screws up efficiency. So this really is what we think of as usability. Um, it works the way the person expects it to work. The fourth dimension is the hardest one to explain because we don't have great language, but it's around engagement. It's the ability to maintain focus on the job, the task you're working on, without getting distracted and frustrated so that you can stay with it. And there's an ultimate stage of engagement that's known as flow, where you are just so focused on the job that the world disappears. I once worked for literally over 30 hours on a programming problem, and I was completely unaware of time passing. I mean, literally for over a day. And that is getting into a flow state, which is the ideal uh, for working on engagement. And the final dimension is trust. Do you believe in the, th in the tool is going to give you the results that you want? Is it accurate? Is it unbiased? Is it reliable? I mean, if you have a hammer and all you get are bent nails, then you really can't trust it to do the job. So these are the five dimensions of the 5D rubric. Um, any questions or thoughts about that? And anything major missing, I can tell you there are two things missing out of this. And I'll tell you why in a moment. The first thing that's missing is aesthetics. There's nothing here about making it beautiful or easy, you know, to look at and, and creating delight, which, um, and the second one is accessibility. There's nothing here about making it accessible. The reason they're at, they're missing, although they do exist, for example, in Peter Morville's um, hexagon, because they're not unique. They affect all the other five. For example, the way that you design something visually, it's going to affect the empowerment, your ability to find things, your efficiency, it affects all of these things, your intuitiveness, your engagement. So it will come out in the user comments. And the same thing is true of accessibility. If I can't use something, I can't read it. Um, I am a certified accessibility um, person. And it, it's, you know, clear to me that accessibility is really all about UX. It's not a separate independent thing. And we actually have a version of the 5D rubric that's um, slanted towards the accessibility of a product. So in building the 5D assessment, basically I copied Amazon reviews. Um, this was something I grabbed off Amazon for some earbuds and um, when you look at the user reviews, you can see there are three parts to the user review. The first thing is that on the customer review, you give it an overall rating. Essentially, you've got a one to five, just like I do, a Likert scale. The second thing is that you've got a rubric. You've got different facets that you can look at and give them each a separate rating, just as you can in the 5D assessment. And finally, 
you have a verbal commentary area, which they call a review. Uh, they do one for the entire review. I do one per facet because I want people to focus on the individual dimensions. And you've seen the style of this. We just repeat it over and over again. We give them five. Uh, uh, the first question should be perfection, right? It's, it's a statement of perfection. And the person can agree or disagree up to a scale of five. And then we say, you know, well, how could we improve this? And that's, that's, and then the, you've already seen the, the way the answers come back with both the quantitative and the value of the quantitative is that it allows you to prioritize what you focus on. If you're getting fours and fives, you probably that's less important than if you're getting twos and threes, that's where you should be focusing your attention. And then you go through these. Some of them are useful. Some of them are idiotic. It doesn't matter because you get them from a large enough group. You're going to get lots and lots of valuable information that you can use to um, figure out what the next step is and how to improve the design. This is a diagram I did that just shows the the way it works, you can see the five. Here are the five dimensions. Each dimension expands into a two-part question, a rating and a comment. And then you go down to the next one. They're in a very particular order, um, which makes sense to me. And then they end up with a one to 10 summary after you've thought through the first five. Okay, so now in the time we've got remaining, let me give you an opportunity to try it out. So I have been working on a website and I have to tell you it's in horrible shape. Um, and excuse me while I try to locate it here on the second, but it is, um, I should have before I, did this, I should have said, if you have a laptop or you have a phone, you can do it yourself. And I will just also bring it up so that I can show it to you if you don't have access to it. So I hope to, over the next few months, turn this into a community, a really valuable website where you can put up your own versions of the 5D rubric and the 5D assessment, share them, ask questions, um, and get all of that into one place. If you scroll down on the five, the assess on this page, you will come to a link. And if you click that link, it will take you to the five, the assessment. Now it's tough to do something for the public um, because we don't all use the same software. So I tried to figure out something that we all had some experience with and figured Amazon is one of the top five websites in the world. So good chance you've used it. So the questions, it's really way too big, too complex for just one assessment. I should be looking at different aspects of it, but for just for the fun of trying it out, feel free to run through this and um, check it out. And as you do that, let me ask, do people have access to a phone or a, a laptop or a tablet? Yes, yes, yes. 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 we're looking. So, so while you're doing that, I will take this up to the responses and you'll see how Google will, I hope, I guess I have to go to edit first. And of course, you don't have to use Google Forms. You can use Microsoft Form. You can use Qualtrics. You can use SurveyMonkey. But it I have says, found... Yeah. Charlie, it says, simply create a new post now, but I don't see where to create a post. I'm sorry. Try that again. Simply create a new the post. The last sentence says, simply create a new post now, period. Ignore that. 
Oh, okay. Terrible website. Oh, okay. Just fine. There's a section that says try it out. And at the yeah. bottom of it is the link you want. Okay. And so far we have one response here on the first question. And you can see that person gave it a four. And you can see the comments. And here is a second question. I don't see the link to try it out. I'm it says try a 5D assessment, but I don't see a link at the bottom. You have to uh, click it and click off of it and click back on it. That's all. Oh, it's I, a, uh, do I co do copy link? No, you got to uh, touch off of it, touch back on it. Just click it. It doesn't work for certain reason. It, it's got a JavaScript function. If I click on the photo, I just see the photo. You're above, you're below where it should be. It's a, um, there's a section. Let me get back to the website, if I can find it here. When I click on 5D assessment, it goes to a page that says, try a 5D assessment. Yeah. And then what do I do next? At the bottom of, of it's not a page. It's the, it's on the home page. Otherwise, it's uh, try a sample assess find the assessment. Yeah. White text, great background. White. Yeah. Bottom again. Show you. Static. You gotta scroll in. You gotta wait because sometimes you gotta stuff instead of voting. Take that here. Stop. Hey, your images are pretty big. That's all. Those images are going to go. Um, this is one of the places where the low vision is kind of brutal. I'm going to have to hire out <laughs> creating a better website. So after this, that's going to be my next project. And what I really want is for you to be able to download the, uh, copies of this so you can tweak it and not have to build it. But that, unfortunately, I have not been able to figure out how to do that in Google Forms. It just doesn't let you share, which seems insane to me. So a teacher can't build, you know, something that he or she wants to share with all the other teachers. But you can see how it's building up automatically. And you're getting all of this information. And you can come back to it, certainly, uh, to look at it. I've got, I think, one minute so I actually I'm pretty close to the end here um, <clears throat> I want to show you this word document that I've created <clears throat> which I use for actually building versions of the 5D assessment it's got four columns so in the first column I've got the five dimensions mine's just five dimensions you should not change the dimensions or their order. Charlie, maybe after I did the, uh, I, I entered my email for the subscription. And then yeah. I'm on an Android, not an Apple. And so we're seeing two different things for Android and Apple. And not to delay you, but. Oh, you, you're, but you're on a sub page, you're not on a main page. Yeah. Yeah, I this will all have to be cleaned up. Um, I plan to put in a discussion area, and then the subscription will be for people who only want to be notified if there's something radically new on the site. And um, <clears throat> I started working on it a year ago, and I let it go. And like about a week ago, I picked it up and said, I better try to get something down. What happened was the Nielsen Norman podcast came out and I started getting all sorts of hits 
and I had nothing to show them. So I tried to pull some stuff together as quickly as I could. Uh, but it, the website is horrible. Can you hear me okay, Charlie? I'm sorry. Can I hear you? Yes. Business people. Uh, and, yeah, go okay, ahead. so I'll go to the mic. Uh, so since you mentioned happiness, uh, I thought you might, if you don't know about this book, it's called That Little Voice in Your Head. It's, a book, by, it's a book by Mo Gowat, G-O-W-D-A-T. Yeah. And his goal, his purpose is to create a happiness for one billion people. That's huh? billion with a B. And uh -huh. I, thought, I thought you might find it fascinating. Uh, and it's a long story about how he decided on that purpose. But since it's related to happiness and you mentioned you mentioned that. I thought I, I mentioned this book. Would you be kind enough to send it to me at charlie5drubric.org? Oh, yes. oh, sure. oh, sure. Yes. I would love to. There's another book that I have read called, uh, I think it's called Joy, Joy, and it's done by a Google uh, person who um, got into sort of teaching about joy and it became so popular it became his profession. He got out of Google and started building. He built this book <laughs> and it's really good. Yes, it could be either the same guy or, or a different guy because uh, this guy has worked in many different IT organizations. I think he did work for Google uh, initially or originally. And uh, he's he's given this talk worldwide. Uh, so yeah, it may be the same guy. I have often said uh, that if I were 20 years younger, I would probably abandon IT, go back to psychology and study trauma and how to create happiness, because I think that's just so important. But anyway, let me show you this last thing, which is um, a four column um, Word document. Very simple. You put the. You can have blank ones and I'll get these onto the site for different versions. And this may be a good way to share it. Uh, you put the dimensions in the first column and the second column, the definitions, and we'll have standard definitions, but you can also customize them for specific projects. Um, and then you put in the two questions, the way you want to do them. This is how I want to tweak the question for the rating. And this is what I want to tweak, how I want to tweak the question for the um, for the comments. And if you're in the design phase of something, instead of doing those last two columns, that's where you can put your user stories. So it seems to me to be really powerful to, as you're building stories, instead of just kind of building them, to say, what stories can I build around efficiency? And what stories can I build around intuitiveness and engagement and trust uh, and empowerment, of course, which are, are the most, uh, the ones that we tend to do. So that's sort of one of the things I'm starting to work on now is to talk with business analysts to see whether they, in fact, find this to be a useful way to, a useful structure. And all of this is part of a larger vision that I call Lucid UX, which is around creating an operationalized version of UX that hopefully will increase the UX maturity of organizations and lead us to producing much more usable um, and uh, delightful, if I can use that term, um, products and services. And is another name for a story a use case? Yes. Okay, thank you. This is the mail um, address. I've just set up uh, 5drubric.org. Since people are so used to doing comms, I also have a com there that redirects to org. But because this is all nonprofit, I wanted to use the org. And um, as I say, I'm hoping that what we can do is out of the you know several hundred thousand user experience people that are in there that are involved in this, 
uh, build enough of a community so that we can start sharing ideas and getting this to a point where um, where we can use it. It is, in fact, after 120, I'm happy to stay as long as you guys want, uh, but I don't want to keep you from other um, other other sessions. Great, thank you. Yeah, terrific talk. Thank you. This is all yeah. this is a lot of the work uh, I read about by like, Stephen Krug. to make me think. I love that book. And I wish I had written it and then I would be able to retire in great comfort. I think he's, I can't believe how many he sold. And if you want to use this before I'm able to get it all together, feel free to contact me. Um, I'm currently on disability leave because of my vision problems. And I will, you know, be really happy to work with you and help you get it. I can't tell you. I'll tell you just very quickly. We have a two hour financial aid uh, program that has to be filled out every year by parents uh, at Princeton. And all we did was plop the link into the end and say, would you be willing to give us feedback? which by the way, you can do anonymously or you can collect the email addresses uh, using Google. And um, we got over 50 people who gave us feedback and we used that to redesign uh, the financial aid package. And as we're redoing, we're in the process of rebuilding that and factoring in the information we're getting from uh, users. And as we get more, information as we release pieces of it, we're continuing to upgrade the user experience. And if it were up to me, every single software product would have this at the end. And uh, have same for websites. That's great. So thank you so very much thank for you. your time. Feel free to, you know, contact me. And I hope you can find some way to make some use of this. It's been great for us. Thank you. And enjoy the rest of the conference.